Welcome everyone to GIA's Knowledge Sessions, a series of talks designed to fuel public knowledge of GIA's research. Uh, we consider ourselves very fortunate to study and learn from GEMS uh, every day, and it's our mission to share our discoveries with the public. I'm Troy Arden, a Senior Research Associate here at the Gemological Institute of America, and I'm joined today by Dr. Sally Magania, a Senior Manager of Diamond Identification. And she is going to tell us about one of the most famous diamonds, the Hope Diamond. And with that, I'm gonna pass you over to Sally. Thank you, Troy, and hello, everyone. I'm glad you're here because that tells me that you're as fascinated by this beautiful blue diamond as I am. Uh, superstition and suspicions of a curse have surrounded the Hope Diamond for decades. Additionally, recent scientific examination of the diamonds have permitted many of its long-held secrets to be discovered. Uh, as you'll see, uh, this diamond has traversed an amazing journey over the last few centuries, and we'll delve into those over the next hour. I wanted to start off by sharing my personal story and encounter with the Hope Diamond. I was performing my postdoctoral assignment at the Naval Research Lab in Washington, DC, and Jeffrey Post, the curator of Gems and Minerals, invited us to collaborate with the Smithsonian, uh, studying their boron doped blue diamonds, including the Hope Diamond. Um, now, before this study, I had focused on engineering applications of boron doped diamond, so this was an incredible introduction to gem diamonds. I was definitely in awe as that picture on the left shows. Um, so while at the Smithsonian, uh, we focused on studying the phosphorescence of the Hope Diamond and other blue diamonds that were part of their permanent collection, such as the Hope and the Blue Heart uh, diamonds, in addition to uh, color diamonds of the Aurora butterfly that were on temporary display. Um, prior to that uh, study, the phosphorescence of the Hope Diamond had been observed many times before, but had not been investigated. So here I'm just showing a few photos uh, from that research. So for the Hope Diamond, um, we'll start off by summarizing its four Cs. Uh, its weight is 45.52 carats. Uh, its shape is a cushion antique brilliant. It has VS1 clarity with whitish graining and the color rate is fancy dark grayish blue. Um, we'll go into detail on several of these aspects as we go through its history and gemological property. So these four C's describe how the diamond is now, but how did it begin? At some time prior to 1668, uh, the blue diamond was found within the Golconda region of India. As you'll see, uh, the story of the Hope Diamond is a global journey with many people having a pivotal role. And I just want to say at the outset that I do hope I pronounce locations and people's names correctly. Um, but uh, the Golconda Fort uh, was an early capital city of the Kutub Shahi dynasty located in modern day Hyderabad in India. Uh, the name Golconda uh, comes from the Thalugu uh, language meaning Shepherd's Hill or Round Hill. And uh, this was the closest fort to the diamond mine. Oops. Uh, Golconda has a, a 6.2 mile long outer wall, uh, four drawbridges and many royal apartments, uh, temples, mosques, stables, all the different components that you'd expect to find uh, within a great city. Uh, the Kalur mines were owned by the Sultan and located about 100 miles away from the Golconda fort. At that time, it would take about six days to go that distance by ox cart. And a recent talk about uh, getting to the, what's now the Kohler mine area, uh, it still takes about two days to get there. Um, the area where the mine is located is known as the Sickle uh, due to this big bend of the Krishna River uh, takes and it forms an inverted U. Uh, its operation was leased uh, to the diamond merchants uh, with an annual fee. Um, millions of carats of diamonds um, 
uh, were mined uh, within the color between uh, mine from the 15th to the 19th century. Uh, the work at the mine was labor intensive, uh, definitely very tedious and dangerous. Uh, there are some estimates about 30,000 people working at the mine. Uh, there was a nearby town of 100,000 that were supported by the mine workers. This mine site uh, was reportedly uh, gravel clay pits. Um, there was also a provision that all diamonds greater than about 10 carats were to be sent to the Sultan. Uh, however, some escaped the notice of the Sultan's agents and were held back by the merchants. And some of these were sold directly to gem buyers such as Tavernier, who we'll discuss quite a bit. Uh, this area was excavated in the 2000s for the Pulichintala irrigation project and is now submerged by 50 feet of water for uh, most of the year. In the years uh, 1668 to 1669, uh, Jean-Baptiste Tavernier uh, brought this 115 carat diamond back to King Louis XIV. So Jean-Baptiste Tavernier is one of the first people we can identify within the story of the Hope Diamond. So we'll spend uh, a bit of time discussing his background. Uh, he lived from 1605 to 1689 and was best known as a gem merchant who traveled extensively throughout India <clears throat> and Persia. Uh, from his writings, uh, uh, he accounts for traveling about 60,000 leagues um, from looking up conversion factors, I saw that that, that conversions varied, but um, we'll estimate it's about 180,000 miles that he traveled. Uh, Tavernier uh, did sell this 115 carat blue diamond uh, to King Louis XIV for 220,000 livres, uh, which is about 2.5 million today. Uh, 2.5 million US dollars today. In 1669, uh, King Louis XIV promised him a title of nobility and he became a baron. Uh, he also wrote about his travels and this book uh, did become a bestseller within his lifetime. So our next owner was King Louis XIV. Uh, during his long reign, uh, many notable changes took place in France. Uh, some of these were good, uh, such as bringing France from a deficit in 1661 to a surplus in 1666. Uh, he also sponsored many artists and composers and standardized the legal systems uh, within France. Um, however, he also revoked the Edict of Nantes and advocated for absolutism in which the monarch holds complete autocratic power. He stylized himself as the Sun King, uh, giving the impression that he is illuminating society and that people might bask in his glory. Uh, this depiction went well with his philosophy of the divine right of kings. Uh, King Louis XIV uh, had one of his court uh, jewelers, Jean Pitou, uh, supervise the recutting of the 115 carat blue diamond. Uh, the king likely ordered the stone recut because of differences between Indian and European uh, preferences for diamond faceting. Uh, Indian gems were generally cut to retain size and weight, while Europeans often wanted them faceted to reveal uh, the diamond's luster and brilliance, similar to our uh, aesthetics today. Uh, this diamond uh, was referred to as the great violet diamond of his majesty in the historic royal archives. And that's because at that time, violet meant a deep shade of blue instead of a distinctly different hue like it means today. Um, in early years after the stone was purchased, uh, the stone uh, was uh, kept in his uh, cabinet of curiosities at Versailles where he would show it to special guests. Guest. Later on, he had it set uh, in which he could wear it as a brooch or as a ribbon around his neck. Um, an inventory of the French crown jewels from 1691 reveals that the French uh, blue was a uh, quote, set into gold and mounted on a stick. In uh, 2012, a computer simulation uh, that we're showing here on the screen uh, revealed that the eight central facets on the pavilion of the French uh, blue, uh, that when it was uh, set in gold, had its gold backing. 
And with this setting, it would appear to have a gold sun in the center of the blue diamond. Uh, the colors of the French monarchy, blue and gold, uh, symbolize the divine standing and power of King Louis XIV, the Sun King. And this uh, diamond, no doubt, uh, really thrilled King Louis XIV. Uh, jumping ahead, uh, in 1749, King Louis XV had the French blue set in the Order of the Golden Fleece. So I'd like to give a little bit more background about the Order of the Golden Fleece, because uh, we'll see it again mentioned later uh, as well. Uh, King Louis XIV's uh, great-grandson, Louis XV, uh, inherited the royal jewels when he ascended to the throne. Uh, so in December of 1749, uh, King Louis XV asked uh, the Parisian jeweler Pierre-André Jacquemin to create an emblem of a knighthood for the Order of the Golden Fleece. Uh, the finished emblem featured a number of spectacular gems, <clears throat> including the French blue diamond, the 107 carat uh, Cote de Bretagne, uh, which is a red sp spinel. Uh, it's uh, carved into the shape of a dragon, and it was originally thought to be a ruby. Uh, we've seen that many times throughout history in which a, a, what was thought was a ruby is actually a spinel, and uh, several other diamonds. Uh, it was rarely worn, uh, functioning instead as a symbol of the king's power. Uh, this order of chivalry dates back to the 1400s and continues through until today. And then, uh, yes, we'll see uh, that the order of the Golden Fleece was again worn by a British king. In 1791, uh, King Louis XVI is now the reigning monarch. Uh, he and his family uh, had been captured uh, during the French Revolution. Uh, the royal jewels were handed over to the revolutionary government and, and stored in the Guada Muabla. Uh, in uh, 1792, uh, the French crown jewels are stolen from the Guada Muabla. And so just a little bit about that, uh, certainly how the theft came about is definitely an interesting story. In fact, if one were to write a movie about all the hijinks uh, with the sequence of events, it might be likely dismissed as such as comedy of errors and oversights that it would be considered unbelievable. Uh, the jewels were kept on the first floor of uh, this building. Um, and a year before, uh, an inventory was made of the crown jewels, and they were valued at about 24 million livres, or 123 million US dollars in today's currency. That's all of the crown jewels, uh, not just the French blue. Uh, they were stored in boxes and locked cabinets uh, in a chamber, which was also locked, bolted, and secured with wax seals. However, the location was well known. Uh, for a while, the jewels had been laid out once a week for the public to, to view. Uh, Rastu, uh, the new head of security, had numerous concerns. He wrote several letters to complain uh, that he only had a dozen men when he needed about 60. Um, often the guards were left without relief for 48 hours or even 60 hours. Uh, however, Paris was in chaos and uh, Rastu received no response to his letters for additional help. On the night of September 11, 1792, a group of thieves climbed through those first floor windows uh, into the room where the French crown jewels were stored and they escaped with some of them. At the time, no one in the storehouse had even realized that a theft had occurred as no guards had been posted with inside the room and there hadn't been like a daily check to verify that the jewels were still there. Uh, realizing the lack of security, the thieves returned several nights over the next week to steal more and more. Uh, by the evening of September 17th, uh, the group of thieves <clears throat> had grown significantly uh, and now included over a dozen uh, people. Uh, they were loud and reckless and finally had attracted the attention of the security. Uh, and then, but the security, instead of confronting the thieves, went around to wake up the caretaker. He woke up with stew uh, and the wax seals on the room were not broken. So they debated for about 30 minutes about whether to enter. And by that time, by the time they finally did enter, all the thieves had scattered off into the night. Uh, most of the French crown jewels were recovered over time. Uh, these include the Sanzi and the Regent, which are now held within the Louvre. The French blue covered took a different path.
uh, what had been the French blue uh, resurfaced in London nearly 20 years later, in fact, 20 years and two days later, although no one apparently recognized its origin. Uh, it had been uh, by then recut to a smaller, although still spectacular gem. Uh, the first reference uh, to this diamond is a sketch and description made in September of 1812 by the London jeweler uh, John Francis Dion. Uh, he wrote, and I'm quoting here, uh, the above drawing is the exact size and shape of a very curious, super fine, deep blue diamond, brilliant cut and equal to a fine, deep blue sapphire. It is beautiful in all perfection without specks or flaws. And, and the color even and perfect all over the diamond. Uh, Francillon does not mention whether, where the diamond came from or who had cut it. He does describe how he traced around it with his pencil. Um, additionally, uh, this Francillon memo is dated just two, two days after that 20 year statute limitations for crimes committed during the French Revolution uh, had passed. Uh, however, there is uh, no evidence that Francillon knew that this diamond uh, was derived from the French blue. Uh, in 1813, uh, James Sowerby, uh, a naturalist known for his illustrations of minerals and other objects, uh, he wrote, and I'm quoting again here, uh, Daniel Eliasson Esquire has in London a nearly perfect blue brilliant of 44 and a half carats that is superior to any other colored diamond known. Okay. Uh, by the 1820s, uh, this diamond was no longer in Elias's possession. Now, it's difficult for history to hide such a large and distinctive uh, blue diamond. In 1821, uh, Sir Thomas Lawrence painted a portrait of King George IV wearing a large blue stone as part of the Order of the Golden Fleece. Its color and dimensions reportedly correspond very well with the Hope Diamond. Uh, John Ma in 823 wrote uh, that a superlatively fine blue diamond weighing 44 carats and valued at 30,000 uh, pounds, formerly the property of Mr. Eliasson that we mentioned on the previous slide, uh, is an eminent diamond merchant and is now said to be in possession of our most gracious sovereign. Um, that would be King George IV. However, no evidence leaking the Hope Diamond to the King has ever been found in the British Royal Archives, and we do not know for certainty that the blue stone uh, is the one painted in this portrait. Um, nevertheless, it is speculated that blue stone is the Hope Diamond. Um, when the King died in 1830, his estate had massive amounts of debt, and it's also speculated that at this time, the diamond changed hands again. In 1839, uh, the blue diamond is now in the possession of Henry Philip Pope. Uh, however, we are not fully sure of the date it was acquired by him. So who was Henry Philip Pope? Uh, he's the man to give this diamond its enduring name. Uh, he was born in 1774. Uh, he was a wealthy British banker with taste for fine art and precious, precious gems. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, a catalog uh, uh, in 1839 of his gem collection that was compiled at his death uh, mentions the large blue diamond weighing 45.5 carats. Uh, the diamond became known as Hope's Diamond or the Hope Diamond. Uh, the catalog describes the diamond as a most significant and rare brilliant of a deep sapphire blue of the greatest purity and most beautifully cut. Uh, it was set in a medallion uh, with uh, rose cut colorless diamonds and a pearl that dropped from the bottom of the medallion like a pendant. Uh, Hope does not record when or where he acquired the diamond. Um, among his other gems was also the Hope Pearl. He was descended uh, from a family in Amsterdam that were merchant bankers uh, and made loans to many countries, including the United States for the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, Henry Philip Hope died in 1839, uh, leaving his possessions to his three nephews, uh, Henry Thomas, Adrian, and Alexander. Uh, in his will, Henry Philip Hope divided his money and property amongst uh, these three brothers, but did not leave instructions about how to divide up his gem collection. Uh, that led to um, uh, years and years of arguments between the three brothers. Uh, 
which was finally settled in 1849. Um, the property went to Adrian, uh, the Hope Pearl, and about 700 other precious gemstones went to Alexander. And then the Hope Diamond and several other gems uh, went to Henry Thomas. So then Henry Thomas Hope became its next owner. Um, in 1851, uh, Henry Thomas Hope uh, loaned the Hope Diamond for display at the Crystal Palace uh, during the Great London Exhibition. Uh, according to a catalog from the exhibition, uh, 28 diamonds from the Henry Philip Hope collection uh, were exhibited. Uh, Henry Thomas Hope uh, left his possessions, uh, including the Hope Diamond, uh, to his wife Anne when he passed away in 1862. Uh, Anne left it to her grandson, uh, Francis Hope, in 1887. Uh, Lord Francis Hope was more extravagant than his grandmother Anne um, had expected. Uh, he quickly squandered his inheritance and fell into tremendous debt. Uh, to, uh, to avoid bankruptcy, uh, he asked his relatives for permission to sell the Hope Diamond. And eventually they agreed and he was able to do so. Um, so in 1901, uh, Lord Francis Hope sold the Hope Diamond uh, to a London diamond merchant, uh, Adolf uh, Weil. Uh, who then sold the diamond to uh, Joseph Frankel, a sons and company in New York shortly thereafter. Um, one source reported that Frankel paid uh, $250,000 for the diamond. Um, he, brought the, he brought the Hope Diamond back to New York City to try and sell it in America, but he received no realistic offers. And so the Hope Diamond was locked away in a New York safe for several years while he tried to find a buyer. He finally did find one in 1908, uh, Salim Habib. Uh, he was a Turkish uh, diamond collector and merchant. Uh, he purchased it for uh, $200,000, um, which is about $5 million today. Um, uh, Habib's collection was put up for auction in June 1909 and sold to a jeweler named Rosenau. Um, what's interesting about that date that he sold in June um, 1909 is that an incorrect New York Times article mixes fact with fiction, and it manages to add to the legend and the mystique of the Hope Diamond. On November 17th, 1909, a different Slim Habib uh, was on board the mail steamer, the Seine, uh, close to Singapore when it sank. Uh, however, the newspaper reported that it was the Habib of our story and that he reportedly had the Hope Diamond with him. Although a collection uh, correction uh, was uh, added the next day, uh, a salvage operation for the Seine began uh, from Singapore. A Scottish diver found the safe of the sunken ship, uh, but of course there was no blue diamond. Uh, the story of the Hope Diamond presumably going down in a shipwreck and being the focus of an unsuccessful salvage operation may sound eerily familiar for anyone who's watched the movie Titanic. Uh, this erroneous legend was perhaps the inspiration uh, for the fictional blue diamond used in the movie. Nevertheless, the Hope Diamond was not in the shipwreck and its uh, story has continued. Uh, in 1910, uh, Cartier uh, purchased the Hope Diamond from Rosenau. Uh, the Hope Diamond arrived in the U.S. on November 23, 1910, where it was valued at $110,000 for customs, and plus the $10,000 duty for an unmounted gem. Uh, Cartier decided to embellish the building story of the bad luck associated with the Hope Diamond to include a curse. Uh, he would use this to further distinguish the diamond uh, to potential buyers. So in 1912, uh, Evelyn Walsh McLean uh, buys the Hope Diamond. So as the next major character in our story, uh, we'll explore her life uh, for a bit. Uh, in 1912, uh, Pierre Cartier uh, sold her the Hope Diamond um, uh, along uh, to her and to her husband, uh, Ned McLean. Uh, the sale was the result of two years of work. Um, the McLeans had been very good clients of Cartier. Uh, they had previously purchased the 94.8 carat Star of the East Diamond 
1908 while they were on their honeymoon. Um, and then Pierre arranged to meet with them in 1910 while they were on vacation in Paris. Uh, Pierre's strategy worked out. Uh, Evelyn absolutely adored the Hope Diamond and several months later purchased it from Cartier for a price of $180,000 plus the return of an emerald, pearl pendant and diamond necklace that she no longer wanted. Uh, because of the rumored curse, uh, the sale included the clause should any fatality occur to the family of Edward B. McLean within six months, the said Hope Diamond is agreed to be exchanged for jewelry of equal value. Not something you see with every uh, jewelry sale. Uh, Evelyn Walsh McLean was also famous for the cavalier manner in which she treated the diamonds, just letting her great Dane wear it as a dog collar and while she was swimming. Um, now, in the years after purchasing the diamond, she did have some family tragedies, including the deaths of her uh, son and her daughter. In 1947, Evelyn McLean died. Uh, the Hope Diamond is eventually purchased by Harry Winston. Uh, Harry Winston is also a legendary figure. He grew up working in his family jewelry store. Um, an interesting story told by his family was that when he was 12 years old, he spotted an emerald in a shop window and bought it for a quarter uh, or 25 cents. Uh, he then sold it two days later for $800. Um, he bought the Hope Diamond in 1949 and the stone became a centerpiece in his uh, quote, court of jewels, uh, which was traveling a uh, show of some of his notable gems. Uh, his intention uh, was to build up the mystique and demand for diamonds in the post-war period. Um, he eventually uh, decided to donate the Hope Diamond to the Smithsonian. Uh, he had several reasons for this. Um, first of all, he was inspired by patriotic and educational goals. And he um, wanted to show people uh, uh, an incredible example of a natural diamond. Um, and also, he had learned about the laboratory-grown diamonds that had been produced earlier in the 1950s by General Electric, and he wanted to show off natural diamonds as something distinctly different from the, their synthetic counterparts. He also highly revered the United States and wanted the U.S. to have some jewels that could rival the crown jewels of some European countries. Um, the negotiations uh, with the Smiths with the Smithsonian uh, proceeded for about a year and the diamonds uh, were finally transferred in November of 1958. So the next event in our timeline is that uh, in this year, 1958, uh, the, Smith the Smithsonian uh, receives uh, the Hope Diamond. So just a little bit of just a little bit about that day. Uh, the package was received on, on November 10th, 1958. It was sent through the United States Postal Service as Harry Winston considered it the safest way to transport gems. Uh, the package uh, was marked, uh, please deliver 11.45 a.m. Uh, 11.10.58. Uh, post officer uh, James Todd uh, presented the package to Dr. Leonard Carmichael, uh, the Smithsonian Secretary pictured uh, within this photo from left to right are Mr. Ronald Win Winston, uh, Postmaster General Arthur Summerfield, uh, uh, the United States Postal Service letter carrier James G. Todd, uh, Ms. Uh, Edna Winston, uh, this is the wife of Harry Winston, and then Dr. Leonard Carmichael. So uh, now we're into the Smithsonian years for the diamond. Uh, in 1962, uh, with First Lady Jackson Kennedy's assistance, uh, the Hope Diamond was loaned for a month to the Louvre Muse Museum for the exhibition of 10 centuries of French jewels. Uh, it was displayed with two famous diamonds, the Regent, uh, which is a 140 carat uh, brilliant cushion cut diamond and the Sansi, uh, which is a pale yellow 55 carat uh, pear shaped diamond. Also on display was the coat that it Cote de Britannia. As you may remember, that's the red spinel uh, carved into the shape of a dragon that um, was uh, part of the French blue, that along with the French blue diamond had been um, part of uh, the order of the Golden Fleece. 
Um, this exhibition marked the reunion of these two gems after 170 years apart. Uh, in exchange, the Louvre's masterpiece, uh, Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa, was loaned to the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. from January 8th uh, to February 3rd, 1963. Uh, in 1965, uh, the Hope Diamond was loaned uh, to De Beers and traveled to Johannesburg, South Africa, uh, for the Rand Easter Show. Uh, that was one of the largest consumer exhibitions in the world. And the Hope Diamond was definitely the main attraction in the Diamond Pavilion. In 1976, uh, the Hope Diamond uh, is reunited once again with the royalty, uh, Queen Elizabeth II and uh, Secretary Ripley are, are viewing the Hope Diamond uh, during her visit to the United States. In 1983, uh, the Hope Diamond uh, traveled to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York for the 50th anniversary of Harry Winston Incorporated. Uh, the Hope Diamond was reunited with the Star of the East. Uh, that was a diamond that had been previously owned by Evelyn Walsh McLean. And then uh, the Idol's Eye, that's a 70 carat diamond that had been exhibited at the Rand Easter Show in 1965 along with the Hope Diamond. In 1988, uh, GIA uh, graded the Hope Diamond. So in 1988, uh, several uh, GIA graders examined the Hope Diamond and they were able to provide the four C's for the stone. Um, they were also able to put the Hope Diamond in contact with other graded diamonds. Uh, so here are a few aspects of the grading report uh, highlighted. Uh, the clarity of the Hope Diamond had been uh, previously noted as um, all perfection without specks or flaws. Uh, that was by Francie Young back in 1812. And uh, apparently flawless, uh, that was a 1975 Smithsonian observation. However, the GIA clarity grade uh, was the S1. Uh, that was based on a few wear marks that the stone had accumulated during its adventures over the centuries, um, a few minor feathers and a whitish graining. Uh, although whitish graining is characteristic of natural color blue diamonds, it's not always present to the extent that it will affect the clarity, uh, clarity grade as it does with the hope. Um, the fluorescence is showing as none, uh, as, uh, as that is what it's shown on grading reports uh, due to its response to long wave EV. Uh, the phosphorescence that we'll mention later is often distinct from fluorescence observations and is best activated by shortwave UV. Uh, also, uh, please note again that the color grade is fancy dark grayish blue. Um, that will be important later when we're discussing phosphorescence. In 2005, uh, the phosphorescence of the Hope Diamond was analyzed in depth and by using spectroscopy. So the, fire, the phosphorescence of the Hope Diamond is a fiery red color that can endure for well over a minute. Um, it has been observed and documented many times, but hadn't really been studied in depth or documented with uh, spectra. Uh, here, uh, we study the Hope Diamond along with other blue diamonds that were on temporary and permanent display at the Smithsonian. Um, uh, natural type 2B diamonds can show phosphorescence bands at 500 nanometers uh, that appears uh, cyan or greenish blue and another band at 660 nanometers in the red range. Okay, so uh, here I'm showing on the right is the phosphorescent spectra for the Hope Diamond. It plots wavelength on the horizontal axis, phosphorescence intensity on the vertical axis, and then time on the diagonal axis. Uh, the spectrum at the back uh, was the greatest intensity and it indicates the first data point after the UV source was turned off and then uh, we come forward with increasing time. Okay. So the Hope Diamond shows a small quick decaying band at 500 nanometers and a much stronger longer lasting band at 660 nanometers. Okay. So when uh, viewing the phosphorescence of the Hope Diamond in life uh, we could uh, see it start off as an orangey red and then when the 500 nanometer band had decayed away, we could see a transition uh, to a more uh, red color. 
Also, uh, we were able to determine the decay times uh, for the 500 nanometer and the 660 nanometer phosphorescence bands. Uh, that's how long it takes for the phosphorescence to decrease by half. Um, and then uh, from the study, the decay times were not significantly greater than other diamonds. Um, however, the size of the hope diamond allows that phosphorescence to appear to endure for much longer times since uh, you're activating a much larger volume. And so it's visible to our eyes for a longer time and well over a minute. So this slide shows phosphorescence data collected on uh, other type 2B diamonds. Uh, if we collect spectra on these diamonds while they're phosphorescing, we can see that some natural diamonds have a uh, dust the red band is 660 nanometers, uh, like this diamond at the bottom left. Um, other diamonds have uh, blue phosphorescence, like uh, this diamond at the bottom right. Uh, some diamonds, like the Hope, show both the 500 and the 660 nanometer bands. Okay, so the upper plot shows a comparison of the body color of the type 2B diamond versus the detected phosphorescence. Uh, the, fed, the, the red phosphorescence uh, appears to correlate with the gray body color. Uh, remember that the color grade of the Hope Diamond includes a grayish color component, which is entirely consistent with seeing the red phosphorescence as with other type 2B diamonds. Also, over a several year period, uh, computer and physical models were created of the Tavernier Blue and the French Blue. Uh, these were then compared with the Hope Diamond. So realistic replicas of the 115 karat Tavernier Blue and the 69 karat French Blue were created. Um, additionally, computer models were produced of all three diamonds to verify that the Hope could be wholly contained within the French Blue, and then to confirm the widely held belief that the Hope Diamond was fashioned from the French Blue. Uh, in fact, some of the cutting decisions of the Hope Diamond, uh, such as its uh, asymmetric shape, uh, <clears throat> uh, were best explained by its prior history as the French Blue. Uh, the investigators also wanted to examine the possibility if there were any, quote, sister stones of the Hope Diamond. Um, their verdict was that there likely were not. However, it was theoretically possible that this 3.46 carat piece um, could have been sawn from the French blue along one of its pavilion facets. While the work of the computer and physical modeling was proceeding, a serendipitous find by Professor Francois Farja uh, really aided the project. In December of 2007, uh, Professor Farja was searching through the mineral collection at the Natural History Museum of Paris. Uh, he found a small box with a lead replica of the French blue. Uh, this lead case model of the French blue with uh, all 78 facets provided a great three-dimensional representational version of the French blue. Um, from 2009 to 2010, uh, the Smithsonian uh, celebrated uh, the 50th anniversary of the Hope Diamond uh, being in residence at the museum. Uh, this was celebrated by, uh, in September 2009, uh, the Hope Diamond was removed from its setting and it was exhibited unmounted at the Smithsonian for the first time. Also to celebrate that 50th anniversary, uh, an online contest was used to select a commemorative necklace from one of three designs uh, submitted by Harry Winston Incorporated. Uh, the winning piece of jewelry was called Embracing Hope. Uh, this design included three parallel ribbons with baguette diamonds. Uh, the Hope Diamond uh, was set in the Embracing Hope necklace and displayed for over a year uh, before being returned to its uh, better known uh, Cartier mounting. Um, in 2010, uh, some comparisons were performed on the gemological and spectroscopic properties of the Hope Diamond and the Wittelsbach graph diamond. So when the Wittelsbach uh, was auctioned in 2008, it re-entered the public sphere and provided the Smithsonian with the opportunity to compare it with the Hope diamond. Uh, both have a known provenance originating in India and likely both were found in the Kalur mine. Uh, and conceivably, the Tavernier blue could have come from the same rough as the Wittelsbach. 
Uh, however, the scientists uh, found that there were pronounced differences in their spectroscopic and gemological properties and included that these two uh, very rare blue diamonds were created independently. Uh, for example, uh, the decay times of the phosphorescence bands uh, <clears throat> were distinctly different. Uh, the, for the HOPE, it was nine seconds. For the Wittelsbach graph, it was 14 seconds. <clears throat> and the dislocation patterns uh, visualized uh, by the spider webbing pattern, you can see uh, uh, from the blue luminescence uh, lines on the diamond view images uh, show distinctly different pattern sizes. Uh, in 2012, uh, SIMS or uh, secondary ion mass spectrometry uh, was performed on the Hope Diamond. So in 2012, uh, the researchers at the Smithsonian uh, were able to conduct measurements that ha they had long wanted to perform. Um, uh, infrared absorption spectroscopy had shown that the uncompensated boron that is the optically active boron uh, within the Hope Diamond was uh, on average about 1,720 parts per billion. However, that value is different from the total amount of boron atoms within the diamond. Uh, some of that boron is not optically active. This other boron is locked up in various configurations such that the boron cannot contribute to the body color or be optically active. Uh, and so typically when we speak of boron concentrations within type 2b diamonds, we are meaning this uncompensated boron, which can be determined far more easily using IR absorption spectroscopy. However, to, however, uh, to determine the total boron concentration, uh, the researchers had to run a special measurement that would ablate or uh, shoot off a tiny portion of the diamond. Um, which no doubt was a huge decision to make for this, uh, for the Hope Diamond. Uh, and then uh, while they're performing that measurement, they're counting the atoms and, this, and determining what percentage of those are boron atoms. Um, and by this method, uh, the results from the various spots that they tested, uh, they did vary, but the highest uh, recorded measurement was 8,400 parts per billion. So that brings us up uh, to the present. Uh, for many decades, uh, the Hope Diamond has been enjoyed and admired by millions. Um, and this incomparable Hope Diamond uh, remains one of the most visited objects in the world. But we're not done yet. Um, the rest of this talk, I'd like to shift gears a bit and try to put the gemological and scientific properties of the Hope Diamond in context with other blue diamonds. Now, blue diamonds are definitely very rare when compared with colorless or even with uh, other fancy color diamonds, just uh, fancy yellow natural diamonds. Um, but how does the Hope Diamond compare within this rarefied group of blue diamonds? Um, so first off, uh, we'll talk about the locality of where these diamonds are found. Uh, this map uh, shows the type 2B occurrences uh, throughout the world. Uh, it includes the historic location of the Kalura mine in India. And while several uh, lo localities throughout the world uh, have yielded type 2B diamonds, most of those recovered today are from the Cullinan mine in South Africa. Uh, in summer of 2018, uh, we published an article on blue diamonds uh, that had been submitted to GAA to GIA over a decade. Um, this included uh, type 2B, or that is uh, born containing diamonds, uh, similar to the Hope, uh, with a similar cause of color as the Hope Diamond. And so uh, I thought it would be interesting to take that data set of those type 2B diamonds um, that had been submitted to GIA and compare those with the Hope Diamond. And so that would allow some additional context to understand more about the Hope Diamond when compared with its other type 2B cousins. Um, and we had to collect these data over nearly a decade because the Blue Diamonds are so special as a group and uh, certainly easily dwarfed in quantity by other groups of diamonds, just those that are colorless. Um, so we summarized uh, the the distribution of diamonds submitted to GIA and compared them with the Hope Diamond. 
So uh, type 2B diamonds are a very small percentage of all gems. And among those, 5% um, uh, of those type 2B diamonds have uh, a similar uh, uh, color grade, a fancy dark uh, color grade as the Hope Diamond. Uh, this slide uh, shows the color distribution of other type 2B diamonds. Only a small percentage of those, about 9%, have similar coloration uh, to the Hope Diamond, have a uh, uh, color gray that is grayish blue. Uh, now with this slide, I'm gonna diverge a little bit and show some infrared absorption spectra for three uh, type 2B diamonds. Uh, now they all show characteristic absor absorption uh, related to uh, boron at 2,800 wave numbers. Uh, for this deep, deep uh, for this deep blue diamond, uh, we can easily see that absorption gradient that goes from the infrared towards the visible and creates that absorption within the red. Uh, this results in a transmission window within the blue for the diamond. Uh, now, this isn't a perfect correlation, and there certainly are some exceptions, uh, but generally, the more boron you have, the deeper the blue color. Um, and you can see here that it doesn't take a lot of boron to have a pronounced effect on the color of these diamonds. So this plot shows the calculated boron uh, or the uncompensated boron concentration as determined by infrared absorption spectroscopy among 150 fancy colored natural type 2B diamonds. Uh, they're shown in order of increasing boron concentration um, along the x-axis. Along the y-axis, I show that uncompensated boron concentration in parts per, per billion. Uh, the boron concentration uh, of the Hope Diamond has been provided um, as 1,720 parts per billion. And as you can see, the vast majority of natural type 2B diamonds have boron concentrations lower than that. Okay, uh, Among natural fancy colored type 2B diamonds, 81% have boron concentrations that are less than 500 parts per billion, and 97% had boron concentrations less than what's been reported for the HOPE, uh, 1,720 parts per billion. Uh, therefore, uh, the HOPE diamond has significantly more boron than the vast majority of type 2B diamonds. Uh, this plot shows the carat weight distribution of natural color blue diamonds graded by GIA from 2008 to 2016. Uh, the histogram is divided into 0.1 carat uh, increments between 0 and 10 carats. Uh, you can see noticeable spikes at some of those weight thresholds, such as at 1 carat, 2 carats, 3 carats, etc. Um, this plot includes 98.9% uh, of the blue diamonds as the percentage of blue diamonds that weigh less than 10 carats. Um, the Hope Diamond is sitting way, way up at 45.52 carats. So definitely uh, very rare that any blue diamond would have a, um, a weight approaching that of the Hope Diamond. This plot shows the distribution of the phosphorescence response and whether both bands, one at 500 nanometers or and the one at 660 nanometers are detected. A majority of them show uh, only the 500 nanometer band as dominant. 22% uh, of the blue diamonds showed similar phosphorescence uh, spectra as the Hope Diamond. Uh, with that, I just want to conclude by saying that the Hope Diamond uh, will continue to please millions of visitors uh, uh, at the Smithsonian and that uh, scientists will uh, certainly continue to unlock more of its secrets uh, within the coming years. Um, thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you very much, Sally. That was uh, excellent. Uh, we've got a few questions. Um, starting off, uh, is there a chance the grayish modifier is the result of whitish graining or any other graining? Uh, typically, uh, the grayish color comes as a result of plastic deformation um, and is um, 
usually independent of the whitish graining. Uh, a 1998 article by uh, King, uh, John King, uh, and published in Gems of Gemology found that about one fourth of those diamonds uh, had whitish graining, and, but that it didn't directly correlate uh, with the grayish coloration. Um, there, there can be some similarities in between like what brings about plastic deformation, therefore gray color, and then also what brings about whitish graining, but I, um, it's not fully sure that the two are exactly related. Okay. Um, why do you think it has renamed, retained the name Hope rather than say the provenance of where it came from or something like that? Um. Oh, that's a good question. I think uh, it's been known as the Hope Diamond for many, many years. I don't know that there's been any major initiative to rename it. And then also it's uh, a nice confluence in which it is called Hope. And so you can uh, think of Hope not just as this person's name, but also in the, the emotion. And so I, mm -hmm. I think that... Um, both of those uh, help lend its name to its uh, enduring, uh, keeping the name of hope. Okay. Um, how common uh, is red phosphorescence in other blue diamonds that we see at GIA? Um, let me, I'm going to back up. Um, he, uh, here we show a slide uh, in which about 22% of the diamonds have uh, the 660 nanometer band was uh, dominant, and then we had about 11, or, uh, sorry, about 10 to 12 uh, percent that had the 660 nanometer band only. And um, and you may remember from a previous slide that the vast majority of these have a, a grayish color component um, with them. Okay. Um... Can you speak to the uh, curse of the Hope Diamond? Uh, well, I can, uh, <laughs> as I mentioned at the beginning, I got to st study the Hope Diamond. I got to interact with it. I, I've i not had the curse affect me personally. I was also pregnant with my second son at the time and it has not affected him. Um, I, I know that the postal carrier that brought the Hope Diamond uh, to, uh, to the Smithsonian, um, Mr. Todd, that he had his house burned down. Uh, I know that there have been some other uh, things that have correlated uh, with someone coming into contact with the Hope Diamond over the years. Um, personally, I have not had it affect me. At, uh, and many of the other people that I know that have worked with it uh, in the year since it came to the Smithsonian haven't uh, had anything that would uh, be ascribed to the curse. Uh, there's a lot of the stories, backstories from uh, historical issues that I think were embellished. Uh, I don't, there's no evidence that Tavernier uh, stole uh, the blue diamond from people in India that it was likely purchased. Uh, he had a, he had quite a extended relationship with them and it's unlikely that he would have stolen that diamond um, from uh, from them. Also, there's really no evidence that Tavernier met a violent, violent end in Russia. So there's, uh, uh, so I think a number of the issues uh, related to the Ho curse of the Hope Diamond have been embellished. And I've had some personal contact with the Hope Diamond and have not been affected by the curse. Um, the, the gold backing that gave the the diamond sort of that sun shape. Yeah. Uh, was that a common jewelry uh, technique or practice back in back in the day? Or um, is, was that an unusual feature for a diamond? Um, I, I'm not fully sure about how, how common it was, but in order for that uh, <clears throat> gold to shine through, uh, the um, the cutter, uh, Jean Pitou, uh, he had to uh, understand about the critical angle of diamond and that those uh, seven facets on the back that allowed the gold to come through, those had to be, had, had an angle of less than the critical angle of diamond. They were about 24 degrees. And so the, the diamonds that are flanked uh, on 
flanking around that have, have angles greater than that critical angle, but those were less. And so that required him to have a, a really good understanding of how uh, light moved and uh, uh, through the diamond. And so I'm not sure how common it was that people knew that uh, and then how often it was implemented, but it was uh, a brilliant way for him to uh, really please uh, uh, King Louis XIV uh, by taking advantage of that for this diamond. All right. Uh, and then one final question. How much does the Hope Diamond cost? Okay. That's, that's a good question too. Uh, we've had, I, I've mentioned throughout the talk that there were several times it changed hands and there were sale prices for each of those um, that we can look to. Uh, Tavernier sold it to King Louis XIV for uh, 220,000 livres, uh, which converts to about 2.5 million US dollars today. Uh, the last private sale uh, was Cartier to Evelyn Walsh McLean uh, for $180,000. Um, and in today's dollar, that would be about 5.4 million US. But last week uh, on, uh, if you watched uh, Final Jeopardy on Veterans Day, uh, November 11th, the uh, Final Jeopardy question, uh, the category was priceless objects. And when that category came up, I was like, I wonder if they're talking about the hope because what else could it be? You know, that's priceless. And it turned out that that question was about the hope diamond. Uh, and so I think that would probably be the best answer. You know, you know, producers of Jeopardy agree that it is a priceless object. And I would definitely agree that it's, uh, it's history, it's uh, the rarity and the confluence of the different gemological and spectroscopic uh, pr uh, properties cannot be matched. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we are just about out of time. Uh, I wanna thank you again for an excellent talk on the history of one of the most famous diamonds in the world. Um, please join us uh, next time for a talk by Dr. Yoon Lo on the uh, effect of fluorescence uh, and its impact on the visual appearance of diamond. And that will be on Thursday, December 16th. Um, and with that, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Thank you. <laughs>